performance, how to be your best in life. Welcome. Thanks so much. Excited to be here. So first of all, as a runner, I definitely know the connection between mind and body. And I know how sometimes as connected as we want them to be and work together, they don't always do that. <laughs> so yeah. can you tell me a little bit about how you can get the best out of yourself when maybe your body is not at its best? Yeah, the first thing I would say is you can't believe everything that you think. Yes. Um, I have a specialty in performance anxiety. And what so many of my runners and other athletes get out of it is the idea that all the things that they're weighed down about and fighting their thoughts and having to be positive and feeling confident are not prerequisites to run well. It sure as heck helps. Yeah. I mean, I'm not denying the fact that sure. positive thinking makes makes the distance a heck of a lot easier. But we really want to understand what's our mind's job. And in short, it's our survival instinct for our mind to look out, particularly in the areas that we care the most about, and look for threats to protect us. Mm -hmm. And if we're a runner and we care about running, then much of our anxiety and negative thoughts are going to be in that area about like, can I finish this distance? Who's going to beat me? Are my parents going to be disappointed? Am I going to meet my goals? Uh, am I going to get a cramp? Like whatever it is that's weighing you down, I'm not good enough is a real popular one across all human beings. And when we just believe that those thoughts are in there, if we give them automatic truth or validity, we're missing the biology behind it. So I encourage my athletes to to really start to interact with their thoughts in a way of of not is it true or false, right or wrong, positive or negative even, but is it helpful or hurtful? Mm -hmm. Because they're really just warnings. If you're anxious and nervous about something, it's really just like a like a red flag or a fire alarm, just kind of saying, hey, check this out. There might be something here. And if you can learn to separate it out and realize when there isn't anything to respond to and then refocus on your race plan, that's that's really I've summarized a lot of psychology until just two minutes. But but that's really the path that you want to get down. So what what is the most common thing that people come to you with the the hurdle they're trying to get over? Well, for my runners, I mean, a difference according to the sports, but for my runners, it's it's definitely uh, pain. Uh, they're fatigued, you're tired. You mm -hmm. know, if you're if it's a five k, you know, it's that middle mile that they're struggling the most, or it's it's very often for many of them in the middle. But it's this idea of um, pain tolerance. So some of the biggest quick strategies that I've given for my runners is. First and foremost, understanding that you're in a pain tolerance sport. Mm -hmm. If you want to run faster than you've ever run, you have to feel more pain than you've ever felt. Yeah. And for a lot of my athletes, you know, even higher level athletes, I've been surprised. They're like, oh, I never thought of it that way. I'm like, really? You? How could you not? <laughs> yeah. But the idea is that your body's always going to scream to slow down because it hurts. And if you're having a combative relationship with the pain of running, it's going to be really, really hard to excel. So we go through the skill of developing a willingness to feel the pain in service of the speed. And some of my best athletes have turned it around so that they start to realize that it's not until their pain shows up that the race even begins. Mm -hmm. And then that's when they buckle down. And sometimes it's as simple as saying a mantra like, be willing, be willing, yeah. and focusing on maintaining their pace and their goal pace based on the running science and their, 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 the plan that they have with their coach, independent of the pain that they feel. I'd say that's I the biggest. Uh, for especially runners, I, I do feel like a lot of us, ha we deliberately train for that pain. You train to live in the discomfort or be in the discomfort for however many miles you're out there. What do you do when you have a setback? And I think probably many of your athletes, all sports, have probably been to a point where they've had some progress or even some really, they've reached some really impressive goals. And then they've had a setback, either sure. physically or even emotionally. How do you deal with either, even trying to get back to that point? Because at many times it feels like you never will, will ever again. And that's heartbreaking. So it is. Well, two points, like in reverse order, when you're saying it feels like we'll never get back, I'm like, there goes your mind again. Perfect mm -hmm. example. It's not that you won't. It feels very real. Your mind is telling you that, but that is the biggest red flag. It's the biggest fire alarm that's going off. Let's say you're injured, you tear an ACL, you, you have something where you're out of the sport for a season. 
of course, those thoughts of, am I going to make it back and everything else? Well, these are all the barriers. Your head is just throwing up all those red flags. So first and foremost, going back to the, the first strategy is when you're feeling that way, you just have to hold those thoughts lightly. And this is easier said than done, which is why I'm, I'm a coach and I'll be employed for the rest of my life. But, <laughs> but these are the tips to start, to kind of start to become aware of and kind of say, what's the purpose of this thought? You know, have I been given a diagnosis that my career is over? I mean, if that's the case, you have to deal with that differently. Yeah. But if you haven't been, and especially when you sometimes will find that our doctors and trainers are saying, hey, you just got to give it time and this happens, which brings me to my second point. I've never worked with a runner that's told me they've ever had the perfect race, particularly at the higher levels. And some of my marathoners, they're like, every race goes wrong, <laughs> whether it be a cramp or sun or dehydration or this or that or the other thing, a not ideal sleep. But they're like, it's really, they started to redefine their sport as how do I best overcome the adversity that happens in a race? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, certainly running fast is, is the goal, but that's almost too simplistic. As you really get into your running career, you'll really kind of find out how do I handle all the things that are slowing me down literally. And when you start to look at it in that way, it, it changes the way that you interact with that, with your sport. And so it's not a matter of like, oh gosh, how do I get over this? Mm -hmm. It's sort of a matter of, okay, how do I get over this? Because this is what I signed up to do, which brings yeah. me to my third point. If you have the expectation that adversity is not normal or something that shouldn't happen, but then it did, you're going to constantly be disappointed. I've never met a runner that didn't have some adversity and some is worse than others. But I mean, you, you guys know whether it's, uh, you know, false starts or, you know, <laughs> people cheating in the field or, you know, you name it. There is all of this adversity and it, it is unfair. I'm not saying you shouldn't feel bad or angry about it. By all means, embrace all of those emotions, but please don't have the expectation that everything is going to go smoothly or should. If you start to expect that things are going to be hard and difficult and adversity is going to show up and there's going to be unfair things, you, you prepare yourself to handle them and not get distracted by them. And that's when you start winning. Are there a couple of tips you can give us for preparing yourself? I feel like a lot of people have got to that point, maybe not to the, as well as you could coach them into, but they do realize, yes, life and sport has these ups and downs. We realize that, but sometimes it's hard to figure out well, what tip can help me get through this then? Because I feel like I've tried all the tools in my kit here and nothing's working. Um, yeah, let's talk about maybe injuries. Cause that's the one that I see in runners. Yeah. Off. And if there's, if it's not something that knocks you out and miss a race or two, it's just something that's always nagging. Mm -hmm. And I would say that this comes from the military. Actually, it's this thing called practical acceptance. Okay. And what that means is, and I'll like given the military example, your best friend gets shot and dies right next to you in, in the middle of a battle. Of course, you would want to feel horror and, and grief and all of these other emotions that come up. But if you do that, your life is literally at risk. Mm -hmm. And so in the military, they teach this pragmatic acceptance that's like, okay, we're a man down. Now, you don't stay this way the rest of your life. Like, please, I hope that soldier, when they come home, goes sees a psychologist and gets the counseling that they need for the tr trauma. But it's, it's essential that they just look at things objectively. And you have to train your mindset into that. So in much the same way, you apply that to sport, that whatever the injury is, let's say it's in the middle of a race or you have a cramp, uh, the idea is that you have to kind of say, what do I need to do? Keeping the primary target of, of winning or a particular pace or whatever my goal is. And you, you iterate it in that way. I don't want to say that you don't care about your emotions, but you certainly are prioritizing your actions over your, your emotions okay. for a time limited period. That is these that other things in your life don't, don't matter in that moment. Is that, is that compartmentalizing or is that different? Because I hear that term used a lot and almost in a negative way. Yes. And I think that it's very similar. I think the difference is that it becomes negative when you do that as a coping strategy for your life. Okay. Like you have something bad happen. Um, somebody in your life dies and you're like, okay, well, I got work to do and I got to do this. So I'm going to compartmentalize it. And then it becomes more not compartmentalizing for the moment because I'm at work and I can't deal with those emotions now, or I'm running a race. I can't deal with that factor in my life. Now it becomes stuffing it. Oh. And that's when it's healthy. And I never, I never uncompartmentalize it. I never deal with it. It's become repression. 
Oh. That's when it becomes dangerous. But in the moment of performance, in a race, now if you've got an injury and you're kind of going through the season and now you have to do rehab, the second big thing that I would say is you're still a runner. Yeah. And you're training. You still want to approach your rehabilitation. Rehab's become your new sport. You're still a runner, but you can take that athletic mindset and the same way that you approach your 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 mileage every day and your stretching and everything else. Now you're just changing it. So now you have to do, you know, your stretches and your icing and and understand that that's still part of the athletic process. You're still an athlete and this is how an athlete attacks their rehabilitation. And it's not as much fun. I don't expect it to be fun. And this is none of this makes you feel better. Yeah. Because the goal isn't to feel better. The goal is to get your body healthy so that you can get back and running again. So that would be the other aspect is realize that even when injured, you're still an athlete and you take that athletic mindset of process and apply it to your rehabilitation. And if you do that, you'll make a remarkable recovery. What's the average age of athletes that you help? Well, I guess the average would probably be like 30 because I go as young as 10, 12, 13, and all the way up to master's level athletes of, you know, right. in their 60s, okay. 70s. Nice. So, <laughs> um, yeah. but yeah, I really see the whole spectrum, uh, particularly of runners, because um, fortunately running is a lifelong sport. Tell me a little bit about both ends there. I, I'm fascinated by how young some of these competitive athletes start and the pressure I can only imagine. I, I know as a, you know, amateur, how much pressure we will put on ourselves. I can't imagine having it be something you love, but turn into a career and have all these added, you know, sponsorships and yada, yada, that it continue to become what is its own entity. So can you talk a little bit about how that affects them and how you get them through that? And then I also want to touch on some of the athletes that are well seasoned. Sure. I would say that the the biggest challenge, and this happens at any age, is when people start to confuse their running with their identity. And, and this is actually how I became a sports psychologist. I was a runner. And that was problematic because I wasn't very fast. So <laughs> I was, you know, I had a great mental game, but but I'll, I'll tell you the example of how I got into it. So I was a 800 meter runner across country in high school, and I wasn't really improving in my last year. I was running a, a 211 in my 800. And, you know, 210 was like that magical threshold that I wanted to get through. And my senior year, because I wasn't going to be running in college, but it had even more pressure to beat this, this goal. And I would come across the finish line, not tired. And then be like, oh, you know, 211, I did it again. I just missed, you know, my PR. And then I'd go over to the bleachers and throw up as if I was exhausted. Yeah. And I was being curious, like, what's this about? Long story short, I figured it out after I went to graduate school. But what was happening for me was because my identity was so wrapped up in being a runner. I felt like, well, I didn't feel this. My unconscious mind was sabotaging me from actually failing. Because I'd come across and be like, darn it, I did it again. I know if I, I have more energy, I could beat 210. And it kept hope alive. Now, listening, you may think this is crazy because obviously I was running 211s or 211. And I wasn't winning. I wasn't meeting my goals. I was still failing. And I wish I had the insight as a high schooler then to realize that my girlfriend still loved me. My parents were still happy. My teammates supported me. Like all the stuff that I was afraid was going to happen if I failed, none of it happened, even though I was failing. But it didn't feel like I was failing because in my mind, I still kept hope alive. It was too much of my identity and my performance defining who I was. Now, fortunately, the story ends well. I ran a 209 at the end of the season. Yay. I'm going to believe that the coach didn't like hit it a little bit early, but let's just say that it was official. But the big question for me is that if I didn't have my identity wrapped up in this, given my practice and work ethic, which was tremendous, could I run 205? Could I run a 159? Wow. Unfortunately, I'll never know. And it's because running was more than running to me. And I can't tell you in all sports how many people, when they confuse their achievements with their worth, that becomes problematic, particularly in my runners and my swimmers. I'm like, it's just like you're carrying around a 25 pound weight running around the track. Mm -hmm. It's just this extra heaviness. So to the listeners out there, I'm like, remember why you're running. I'm sure it's not to earn your worth or to prove your value. And it can get confusing that way. You say about these young athletes, when all the sponsorships, when it starts to become something other than that. So often one of my interventions is I, I ask my runner to just go out and remember why you started this. Like leave your watch off, connect with nature, feel the rhythm, enjoy the breathing. 
like just try to get back to that instead of the workouts and the and the drive and the purpose and the outcomes and the measurements like why did you become a runner and for many of them that's that's flipped it and it's gotten back to originally that it's something that i do it's something that i enjoy it's something that i've been built for it's something that god has for me and when you can connect to that and bring that in then the other details and pressures um can be lifted because then it's just a race not to say that's not important mm-hmm. but it's you're more than the race mm-hmm. What about some of, like I said, some of the folks that have been out there for a long time and then, you know, as much as our minds might stay young, our bodies age and it gets tough. So what is it like to work with some of your older clients and what are they? That's the big one. The biggest risk there is the comparison to our former selves. Mm -hmm. And it's different because we grow up like, again, particularly in running, I always have people coming in saying they have to beat other people. I'm like, look, you can't worry about somebody else's race. Like in football, maybe, you know, somebody's going to hit you as soon as the ball is snapped. You have to pay attention to the opponent. But in, but in track and in running, you're running against the clock. And whether you're competing against Olympians or a bunch of fourth graders, I hope that you don't change your strategy (laughs) because, you know, you'll get different results. So, and sometimes like if you have to race against people who are just faster than you, there's nothing that you can do to beat them because Mm -hmm. they're just you know, a minute faster. So, so why the comparisons? They've got nothing to do with you. So we often talk a lot about as we're growing up about the PR and and getting 1% better to yourself. But then we hit this point in life where it's more about losing more slowly (laughs) than actually about gaining. So with those masters athletes, depending on the person and how stuck they are in that, you know, we have to kind of really show some compassion for ourselves and acknowledge that this is the way life goes. Um, sometimes redefine it, you know, okay, if I'm not in it to win it anymore, what am I in it for? What does it look like? What are some more realistic goals or achievements? Um, cause the running community is an amazing one. I mean, mm-hmm. the support, the energy, the, the health and the mental health just by engaging in it. Um, so as time goes on, we start to, to switch it and then, and then being realistic with the goals that we do there too, you know, um, and feeling accomplished. That's where the age groups are helpful. If you still like to be yeah. competitive. It's like, you got to forget about the 20 some things and just say, mm-hmm. Hey, I'm in that 50 to 55 group. So like, how am I doing here? And you could be competitive within that. And then also really respecting it. The other big risk is we still push ourselves and we need more rest or recovery. We may have to drop the mileage. We have to look at our form, do different cross training, run on different surfaces. These are things we may not want to do, but your body will tell you that you need to. And the sooner you can adapt to the reality of the aging process, the longer your career and the more satisfying it can be. Why do you think that's so hard for us? I mean, it's something that we've known for so long and experienced for so long. Why is it hard for us to learn that and apply it? Well, I'm just speaking for myself because I mean, it's happening to me. It's like, because it was more fun to be fast and young and fit and good looking and, (laughs) you know, not having aches and pains. Like there's a reason that, you know, we kind of promote youth in our society. Like, you know, we trade off wisdom, you know, and so that it's just, it's sort of the way it is, but why is it hard? It's well, because, you know, getting older hurts. Let's let's just call it what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, if I could run faster, it's more fun. And, and the world really looks at that too. Like we're looking at the world records and, you know, who wins and the, the whole society celebrates success, usually based on these results. So when we try to make it a little bit more personal, we're kind of getting out of the culture. And I think it's healthy that we do. I'm not Mm -hmm. sure that our culture is the healthiest as evidenced by, again, a lot of the people that I have to work with when they're younger and under all this pressure Mm -hmm. and the mental health that's happening in sports now, thank goodness over my career, that it's no longer a a stereotype or or a stigma rather, but now people are actually seeking it out and and, uh, demanding it at at NFL and NHL and Olympics and things of that nature. So we're moving in the right direction, but Ultimately, I just say, hey, for the older runners out there like myself, you know, it's like you are going to feel that way because it's it's not as much fun and and the decline will continue. Mm-hmm. And there's really no way to make you feel good about that. The acceptance that this is a part of life, if you have sort of spiritual beliefs or you have you know family connections, like there's something else outside of that. And this goes for, again, Olympians and, and, and high, the highest level athletes when they're all just about the winning. And they don't have a bigger purpose or or mission outside of that. They struggle. So we 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 encourage all this winning and by all means work hard for it. 
but it, again, it, continue, it has to continue to be just something that you do, not who you are. So it comes back to that point of it too. It kind of all ties together. Seems like a lot of it is- to make good sense? Yeah, kind of just managing our expectations. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, without it being so cliche, I mean, I think I, I both love and hate cliches because yeah. cliches are true, but we, we just kind of throw them out there as if they're going to magically work. And most people don't understand them. So when we talk about you got to manage your expectations, it's like, okay, what the heck does that look like? What does mm -hmm. that mean? What expectation and what's realistic? And so that's what I want to say with much more compassion to the master's athletes out there, that this hurts. We can't do what we used to. There's there's a bit of grieving sometimes that we have to have for our former selves or our former careers. And if you can be compassionate with yourself and others and and work to accept that in, in an open way, mm -hmm. then the master's career has something different to offer. Mm -hmm. And that's the exciting part. It doesn't replace the grief of what you've lost, but what can this new aspect of running in my 40s and my 50s and my 60s, what, what does this offer me now? And for many people, again, it's like now it's becoming much more about the camaraderie. It comes about maintaining health because now if I'm running and I'm doing this every day, you look around at people who aren't running and you're, you know, you're, you're living longer. You're able mm -hmm. to play with your grandkids. You know, there becomes other reasons to do it than when you had done it when you were 20. And that's the beauty of running, right? This yeah. lifelong sport that promotes physical and mental health. Well, it should look different every decade. Hmm. So if you're a decade older, you know, kind of follow the times. And another way that I like to put it is like, I've never, anytime I've tried to fight reality, reality is always one. <laughs> yeah. So like, if you're 60, well, well, you're 60. Yeah. And I can appreciate that, you know, we're not, we're not in our forties anymore. We're not in our twenties anymore. I just went to the doctor and I was asking some things, well, why is this happening? Why is this happening? He just looked at me like, well, you know, you're, you're 55. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yes, I and. Like, it happen. <laughs> oh. So like this extra weight gain, it's harder to lose weight. He's like, yeah, your metabolism slow. Well, what do I do about it? He's like, nothing. Like sometimes it's hard to accept that I'm human. Yeah. yeah. What's the, what, oh, how many different types of athletes do you work with? Um, what are some, are some we might be surprised. I mean, that we wouldn't think of. Um, as far as, well, as far as levels well, all over, but if you mean as far as sports, yeah. like I did uh, a world champion in dog agility. That was fun. That's um, interesting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and same sport, but I worked with someone whose dog was injured and I had to help the trainer go through the dog's injury and oh. what it was like to read the dog and have the dog come back. So that was, you know, both in the same sport, but, but fascinating. Um, Worked with uh, some martial arts, uh, jujitsu um, specifically, uh, most recently some judo. Um, and then I've got a couple of people from the symphony. So I work with musicians as well um, oh. uh, for auditions and, you know, performance anxiety um, yeah. in, in symphony as well. Worked with an uh, actress. Um, that was fun. Again, similar. So a lot of the performing arts um, and then doctors and lawyers and uh you know, financial planners, like anybody who's under sort of that high stress, the, the wonderful thing about the way that I, I help people work with their thoughts and feelings in a way and that they can actually live their best lives. So I, I really enjoy the idea that I, I can work with people in all aspects of performance, sometimes sport parents, helping them be better sport yeah. parents. So yeah. helping them manage, you know, kids fine, but they're anxious about their kids' performance. So that's yeah. been another uh, group that's been fun to work with. Do you have a specific story throughout the years that really has just stuck with you and made you glad that you're doing what you're doing? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I actually have a lot of them. Uh huh. Um, and I'll see as I talk about this, if maybe one particularly comes, but, but it's the path that typically follows that my typical athlete comes in in distress. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a clinical sports psychologist, so I can work with people who just want to get better, but I also got the specialty in injury and, as I said, performance anxiety. So when I see an athlete come in and I feel their pain and I get excited right away because especially with anxiety, I understand why they're anxious and they don't yet. And so right in the first session, it's often my favorite because then I, I go in and I explain how anxiety is normal, the purpose that it has, most importantly, that they're not broken. 
Mm-hmm. And Trina, when I see their their face get softer with the relief that there's nothing wrong with them, like like I just crave that feeling every day working with my athletes to provide that relief to say this is normal. This is why you should be thinking this way. In fact, sometimes I I add to their anxiety in a helpful way by saying like, and there's this that you should worry about and why shouldn't you? Somebody's trying to beat you and you could lose this. And they're like, thank you. Yes. My perfectionists are another group that I love working with because everybody tells them that nobody's perfect and mistakes are okay. And it infuriates us as perfectionists because we're like, it's not, it actually makes us double down on how intolerable mistakes are. So with my perfectionists, I lean in and I'm like, I want you to be perfect. I'm never going to tell you anything that's going to lower your drive to be great. And if I, like, I promise you that. And I'm like, and mistakes aren't okay. People get hurt. You're disappointed. You lose. And they're like, thank you. And then we can move into the space of say, so what do we do about it? How do I help you become more perfect? And then we can get into the conversation of mistakes and changing that relationship with them and seeing mistakes in service of growing. Not because we're trying to explain it away or make them feel better, but because that's the way to become more perfect. And we can strive for that perfection and let's keep that goal, knowing in our hearts that we'll never get it. But the key is, how do I relate to these mistakes? Because if I beat myself up, I'm actually becoming less perfect. Mm. And so that that's maybe the, and I've had that story happen, I don't know how many times, but that's yeah. maybe one of my favorites because it's something that people struggle with so severely and get really depressed and burned out. And within a, you know a session or two, I'm turning it around and not only are they feeling better, which is great, but now they're performing better too. So- yeah, I love my job. <laughs> what made you go ahead and go that route with your studies? And was it being yeah. an athlete yourself or was it something else that pointed you in that direction? Like a little bit of both. Like you've kind of gotten hints to how it all kind of showed up. Like I yeah. was definitely an athlete and enjoyed it. I wasn't, again, like the highest level athlete and had some disappointments about it, but I certainly had the pressure, got into my head about a lot of things. And I was always just fascinated about psychology to begin with. Um, like in high school, I was reading Freud's analysis of dreams for fun. Like, so I always knew that this is what I wanted to do. So I go through college and I'm like psychology major, one of the few people that decides the major and goes through it. But I still didn't know what in psychology I wanted to do, whether it's sexual abuse or depression or schizophrenia or like I was really not directed. And the last class I took in college was sports psychology. And I was like, well, that's interesting. I didn't know that was a thing. Took the elective. And I'm like, this is fat. Like, I wish I knew this stuff. I'm going back to the bodybuilding competition I had just done, to the the the, the track injury that I had that knocked me out of the sport, to my struggles in high school. And I'm like, I could have used all of this information. Like, why didn't anybody say anything? And I'm immediately seeing how, like, what an interesting thing that not only um, is there a psychology of pathology, but there's a psychology of excellence. Like, if you want to be excellent, you can't do what everybody else does like if you want to be in the top one percent you have to do and think differently than 99 percent of the other people and so to know that there was a whole science about that so then i immediately just combined the two i still i said well look athletes are human beings too so i definitely want to do the sports psychology but i'm not giving up the clinical psychology so then i said i'm going to specialize in what athletes suffer from the most and that's why i went into injury and rehab because i was like well every athlete gets injured so that's going to be my number one yeah and then the performance anxiety as well as you know, other things like, uh, you know, family relationships and communication and others. But, but that's why I really targeted those two, because when I have somebody come in front of me, I'm going to see you and help you be a better athlete. But I also know that you're a human being. And then I found that these skills that I've learned, I started applying them to clinical populations. So I take this performance psychology and I'm working with chronic pain. I'm dealing, you know, helping people with obesity. And I've loved that I could take this positive approach of psychology and apply it to these health populations. And they've responded really well to that too. Um, instead of again feeling broken or you know something's wrong with them and you know all this pathology it's a matter of like hey let's all be the best version of ourselves so whether i'm helping somebody in chronic pain be able to walk from their door to the mailbox or i'm helping an olympian try to you know win the marathon a lot of the techniques are the same the context is just different and that's been fun yeah good uh i want to go back real quick on like for like performance anxiety and how common is that amongst a lot of the athletes that you work with? The better question would be how, like, um, like how much is it pathological or how much is it damaging? Because I, an athlete I had just last week said every athlete has performance anxiety. Yeah, yeah. And I, I like to kind of say that the question is more so, is it hurting or helping you? And that's where I really work. Again, yeah. anybody who's listening, you're nervous before a race, you're nervous about the future, 
You don't have an anxiety problem. You're a healthy human being. You need to worry about this. Here's the best thing to help everybody listening. You will worry and be anxious about the things you care the most about. Mm -hmm. Period. Because if you didn't care, you'd have nothing to worry about because it wouldn't hurt you. If you care, there's a threat, whether it be your, your children, your spouse, your sport, your finances, whatever it is. If you care about it and it doesn't go your way, it has the potential to hurt you. So you will have a natural, normal, healthy, anxious response to that. That's not pathological. How we respond to it is where I do the work. So if that's all I'm thinking about and obsessing, we can do mindfulness exercises to help you learn how to let go and refocus. If it's a matter of, you know, being coming paralyzed and, 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 and stuck so that you can't move or follow through, then it's a matter of how do I just kind of observe these things and then take committed action despite that. If it's a matter of, you know, I'm thinking about it in the wrong way, way and I'm really attaching to it and, and evaluating a lot of things how do I recognize that that's sort of what my mind is doing separate out and have you know different perspectives that I can shake that that are going to be more helpful so it's not the fact that this is showing up it needs to show up but if you're accepting it as truth that's where it's problematic and I have a distorted view because those are the people who I tend to see yeah. so it seems like everybody that way but some people can understand that hey my my anxiety is really excitement ah and when you start to interpret it that way, it's physiologically, it's exactly the same, same rapid heart rate, same shakiness, same sweaty. Like when I'm on a roller coaster for those like roller coasters, you're terrified, but it's exciting. You choose it out. But when you feel that way and being chased by a bear, it feels very, very different. Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> so do you interpret these sensations as a threat or a challenge? So it's another quick fix that if you can say, hey, I'm putting myself in this situation. I don't have to be a runner. I'm putting myself here because it's important to me. This is a challenge. And this anxiety is my body preparing me for that action. And you can use that energy for your race as opposed to it draining you. Excellent stuff. I'd love for you to come back anytime you want. Tell people where they can connect with you and read your books and hear more of you. Yeah, the, the one-stop shop is at dreddieoconnor.com. D-R-E-D-D-I-E-O-C-O-N-N-O-R. And couple of things to highlight on there is a link to my uh, free YouTube channel, Mental Toughness in 60 Seconds, so you can get quick tips there. Um, I've got uh, a sign up for my newsletter. If you like this idea about what, what to do when positive thinking doesn't work, I've got a free training that you can sign up for that and get instant access to that. And then I encourage you, if you, you need some help, I'm, I'm here for the coaching too. I've got a success stories community where I, I'll meet with you as well as having a bunch of things online where you can go at your own pace to get all the training that you need so that you can be your best when it matters the most. So all of that is at dreddieoconnor.com. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I will be looking into more of this and sharing this with my running community and fitness community as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. It's been a blast. Follow along at runradio.net.